Give the Lord a big hand tonight. Give the Lord a big hand tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We praise your name, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May the grace and peace of God be with, uh, with each and every one of us tonight. Um, I'm just really, really happy to be here and... Um, I'm just happy to be a part of what God is doing here at Templo last night as we uh, dismissed the service and a couple of brothers were uh, talking with me. I told them this is a, an exciting time at Templo. It's a, it's, a new, it's a new time. It's an exciting time at Templo. And I'm just, I'm just happy and honored that the Lord is giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. Amen. God is doing an amazing things. New things are going to happen here in Templo. And I want to congratulate Pastor John tonight and just uh, encourage him to keep that legacy alive. To keep the legacy alive. All these great men of God that came and passed through this church and blessed this church. And God used them in such a powerful way. We have to keep that legacy alive. And we have to keep the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in our hearts and in our lives. That in each service that we have dedicated to the Lord, that we can feel the blessing and the power of the Holy Spirit touching our lives. It's the only way we'll be able to save our communities and our, and our nation. Just a revival. Let the Holy Spirit flow again. And let his power manifest as it did throughout the ministries of all these great men of God that have been here at Templo. I mean, it is our time now to fan that flame. Amen. Past revivals do not guarantee future revivals. Each generation needs to hunger and cry out for its own revival. And I believe that God has a revival for this generation. Amen. And for this time, during the ministry of Pastor John, I strongly believe God will pour out a revival. Amen. And the fire will continue to burn in our hearts. Amen. So thank you, Pastor John. We wanna, I, I want to acknowledge once again Pastor Ruth. Amen. Um, Pastor Tanyon, I came to Templo under his ministry. Like I said uh, uh, yesterday, um, they brought me down to minister at a refrigerio for the San Jose section. And um, he was the translator. He was the translator. And um, it was an amazing experience, and, and I always, I always uh, remember because the power of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit was so strong that he would pause in the middle of the sermon. Pastor Tanyo would pause in the middle of the sermon, and he would start speaking in tongues, <laughs> and then he would get back to translating. <laughs> and um, I just remember it, uh, he was so anointed, he was so anointed, and the power of God was moving um, in such a powerful way. He was so sensitive to the spirit. He was so sensitive to the spirit. And I remember uh, the second night of the refrigerio, as I was ministering, uh, the power of the spirit was just moving and I was just laying hands and laying hands. And all of a sudden I turned around and I lay hands on Pastor Dañon and he was so sensitive to the spirit that he fell slain in the spirit right on the altar. Right on the altar, he fell slain in the spirit. And, 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 and I looked at him and I said, oh my God, what did I do? I, I, I just lost my translator. What am I going to do now? <laughs> we had some amazing experiences. And um, Pastor Tanyon, I remember uh, last time I spoke with him, he gave me some very, uh, uh, some words of encouragement. And he said, uh, Brother Lugo, he said, Robert, uh, you keep fanning that flame. He said, uh, because I truly believe that God has called you for this time, for this time. And, um, and like Pastor John was saying, he was always encouraging people. He believed in, in God's calling. And, and I was new here to the Bay Area. Um, I was new here to the Bay Area, and he believed in, in my calling. He believed that God had placed a calling on my life. And I think that's something that uh, characterized him throughout his life. He, he, would, he, would, he, would, he was able to see when God had called somebody and placed a special anointing on somebody's life. And I just thank God for his life and thank God for Pastor John's life. He's been a, an amazing friend. We went to Patton together. We studied together. We, we had uh, amazing revivals uh, back in the day. Uh, uh, and uh, I just want to thank God for Pastor John as well. And uh, I pray that the Lord continues to give him strength and him and his wife, Cindy, his children, 
and that God continues to prosper him and, and, and he can continue in the vision that God has placed in his heart for Templo de la Cruz. So I just want to thank you guys for having me these three days. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, for uh, 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 bearing with me all these three days. It's been an amazing time in, the God, in God's presence. I, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the love and, and, and your love and your prayers towards me. Um, uh, I'm going to be flying out tomorrow, but we've been praying. And when I say we, I, I'm talking about Pastor John and I. We've been praying and we've been uh, having some dialogues and conversations. And um, we were just, uh, God just placed in his heart uh, to share with me something. He said, Brother Robert, are you willing to come back to the Bay Area next year and um can we have a three-day revival here at templo we're gonna have i'm gonna start calling pastors and and get some churches together and would you be willing to come out and 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 be with us for three days uh, and make it a, an annual thing and each year come out and have a revival for three nights with us i said brother i'm always willing i mean i just i just uh, we want to make sure that the, the, the church is, is supportive and the church is on board. And uh, so uh, we, I was praying about it. I called my ministry team uh, uh, this, uh, this morning, uh, as a matter of fact, and I let them know the vision that God has placed in Pastor John's heart. And I said, look, I'm on board. How many of you would be willing to come out and support us and, and just be here with us and share this revival with us? I think it would be an amazing time. I think it would be great. God would do amazing things. And, and um, I'm just here to help and, and serve and, and, just, and just help you uh, keep fanning that flame. Amen. And keep the fire burning. So I'm excited. Uh, my ministry team said, Lugo, if God has placed that in your heart, we're on board. We're all for it. Let's do it. Pastor John, let's do it. Let's, let's make it happen. Hallelujah. How many say amen? I'm excited. I'm excited. Amen. Let's do it. Praise the Lord. I know God is going to do some amazing things. Amen. Amen. So I want to greet every pastor that is here with us tonight. I thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being here. It's been a true honor to be at Templo de la Cruz 100th anniversary. A true, true honor. I'll probably come back in 100 more years, right? <laughs> in another 100 years. Uh, no, we're, we're praying. So I just want to leave you with this before we go into the word of God. I just want to uh, put this uh, 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 before you so you can bring it before the Lord in prayer. Help us pray so that next year, God willing, we can have those three-day revival, the, the three-day revival here. And I know God is going to do some amazing things. I'm, I'm, I'm committed and we are committed. We're going to continue to pray. Uh, and I know God is going to continue to do great things here at Templo. It's been an honor and a huge pleasure to be here. Amen. And I just hope that um, our ministry has been able to bless you this same way you guys have blessed me uh, these three days. Amen? So let's turn to our Bibles. Let's turn to our Bibles. I want to, I, I don't want to be too, uh, I want to be brief tonight. I want to pray with you and, and, and I, and I want to share uh, the word that God has placed in my heart for tonight. It's in the book of 2 Corinthians. Let's look at 2 Corinthians. Let's go to chapter 3, chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. And we're going to look at verse 18. Verse 18, chapter 3, verse 18, 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read the word of God. Amen. When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, say give me a minute. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 18. Verse 18. The title of my sermon tonight, Changed by His Glory. Tell somebody, tell them, be ready to get ready to be changed by His glory. Tell them, get ready to be changed by His glory. Get ready to be changed by His glory. Listen to the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. And we who with unveiled faces... All reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And we, somebody say we. 
look at look at your neighbor and tell him it's all of us it's all of us it's all of us he's talking about 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 all of us and we he's talking about all, all of us who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory all reflect the Lord's glory that's why the enemy hates you so much because you reflect the Lord's glory you reflect the Lord's glory amen with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed. So there's two things happening here. There's two things happening here. The glory of God is being reflected through us, but at the same time, that glory is being reflected to us to bless others. It is changing us. It is transforming us. Amen? I'm just reading the text. I haven't started preaching yet. I'm just reading the text. I'm just reading the text. Are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. So this glory is not only being reflected, it is transforming it and it is ever increasing. So it's not, we have, it's not about, we, about we, we having a good service on Friday and then on Sunday, oh, Sunday was going to be okay. No, no, no. This is increasing. And I believe with all my heart in the name of Jesus that the glory here at Temple is going to be ever increasing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Hallelujah. If you weren't here uh, yesterday, last night and, and Friday night, talk to Pastor John or talk to one of the staff, uh, uh, members of the staff, so maybe they can let you... Uh, give you a copy of the sermon of the series that we were teaching on being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But tonight I want to share with you under the, uh, the title changed by his glory. Father, thank you for your love, for your mercy. Thank you for, thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for saving us. And thank you for doing for us what we weren't able to do for ourselves, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your blessing. And thank you for for this 100th anniversary, Lord, and for all the great men that you brought to this temple, Lord, to serve and, and, and just to preach and teach and lay foundations, Lord. And thank you for their ministries, Father God, and for the legacy, Lord, that they have given us. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in Templo. We celebrate what you've done in the past, Father God, but at the same time, we're looking to the future, Father God. We're looking ahead, Lord, of us, uh, and, we're, and we're just thanking you, Lord, for for the ever-increasing glory that is going to be manifested here at Templo, Lord. Thank you for this ministry. I just pray, Lord, that this ministry can continue to bless this community, continue to bless this city, continue to bless the Bay Area, Lord, and that you help us, Lord, each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, that we may experience an encounter with your glory tonight, Father, that through your word we may be, Lord, transformed and we may be connected with your spirit, Father God, as you continue to work in us and transform us, Lord, and, and as we, Lord, with an open heart, are willing to receive your word in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for your anointing, Father God. Heal the sick tonight. Save the lost tonight, lost, Lord, and let your spirit be poured out. Baptize in the Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill our hearts, Lord. Fill us up, Lord, tonight, Father. That we may be set on fire, Lord. To set this city on fire for Christ. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Somebody give God the glory. Hallelujah. Not too long ago, I had the opportunity of talking to one of my uh, uh, fellow students from Patton University. And um, as we were talking, he said, Luke, I want to share with you an experience that I had as I was reading the book of Malachi chapter 3. And, and um, I was trying to understand why the prophet was, or, or why the Lord was comparing himself to a blacksmith. And, and in order for me to understand it, he, was, uh, um, he told me, I, I actually visited a blacksmith. I said, you did what? 
He said, yes, I actually went to visit a blacksmith. I went back home to my country and I visited a blacksmith because I really wanted to understand why the Lord was comparing himself to a blacksmith. And he said, well, and I said, well, well what happened? What did you see when, when you went into the shop? I mean, how was it? I've never been to a, a blacksmith shop. Well, how was it? He said, well, it's, it's pretty hot in there. He said, he said, his first thing is pretty hot in there. And um, he said, and, and, and when, when I went there, the, the blacksmith, he didn't even acknowledge me. He didn't even acknowledge me. So I just, I just stood by the door quietly and I just, I just watched him work. And I noticed that he took that piece of gold that he had in his hand and he put, uh, the, he used the tongs. That's how you pronounce it. Así se pronuncia, ¿verdad? Las tenazas, the tongs. And he, he put that piece of metal that he had and he placed it in the fire. And he sat right in front of it as the fire burned through that metal. And he sat for a while, and he sat for a while, and he sat for a while. And I noticed that throughout the whole time, he never took his eyes away from the metal. Never. He just stood right in front of the fire, holding those tongues, holding that metal in the fire, and he never took his eyes off the fire. After that, he cleansed it, and he started staring at it. And I was so intrigued, and I said, well, why is he staring at it? And this man had, he hadn't acknowledged me, so I felt I needed to interrupt, and I said, <clears throat> excuse me. And he said, yes, can I help you? And he said, I'm a student of the Bible. And he back to him and said, well, good for you. Well, good for you. He said, I, and, and I've been reading the book of Malachi. And I've been, I've been studying. And, and God compared himself to you. And the man said, to who? Yes, God compared himself to you. To a blacksmith. He said, really? And he said, I'm here because I want to understand. Why would God compare himself to a blacksmith? He said, can I ask you a couple of questions? He said, go ahead. He said, why did you sit down right in front of that flame and you, never, and you never took your eyes off the metal? He said, this is a process that can either purify or destroy. He said, when I stand in front of the flame, I need to keep my eyes on that metal. Because if I leave it too long in the fire, the fire will destroy it. So interesting. He said, and when do you know that the metal is ready? When do you know it's set? I saw you staring at it. He said, yes, I was staring at it. And you looked at me strange. It's not that I'm a narcissist. No, 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 no. He said, what are you looking for when you, start, when, when you keep staring at that metal? He said, I am looking for my image. And until... Are you with me tonight? He said, I am looking for my image. And I will put the metal back into the fire and take it out and look for my, search for my image and put it back in and take it back out. And I know it's ready. I know it's ready when I can see my image. In that metal. My God. He said in that moment. I take it out of the fire. And I know. It's ready. But until I don't see my image. I'll keep it. In the fire. You see, God compared himself to a blacksmith because he is constantly working in our lives to transform us so that we can reflect his image. And sometimes he will use very unusual methods. Sometimes he will use very unusual things to change our lives, to process our lives, amen, to work in our lives. And sometimes he will use some very uh, uh, unusual methods in order for his image to be, uh, in order for us to be able to reflect his image. Now, 
One thing I want you to understand is that the goal of every Christian should be to reflect Christ. We, we are so full of dreams in the 21st century. We are so, so full of dreams and so full of goals that we have forgotten the main purpose, the main reason. Our main goal is not to be famous, is not to be well known. Our main goal is to reflect Jesus. That when people look at us, they see Jesus like Paul taught in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. With Christ I am crucified, therefore no, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me hallelujah hallelujah so somebody tell them you know when you're ready if they see Jesus when they see Jesus in you you know when you're ready when they see Jesus in you when people start seeing Jesus in you our goal as Christians amen and is is to become day by day to become more and more like Jesus and God, as a blacksmith, is at work in our lives. Look at somebody tell me, he's still working, he's still working, he's still working. Take it easy, give me, take it easy, take it easy, slow down. He's still working. I know I, I, I know I got a lot, I know I still got some attitude problems, but take it easy, he's still working on me. I know I got some issues, but take it easy, he's still working, he's still working. God is at work in my life. The church is not a place for perfect people. The church is a place for people who have been forgiven and who people that God is still working in their life. How many of you? can raise a hand and say, God, keep working in me, Lord. Lord, keep working in my life. Keep working. Keep working. Keep working in my life. Keep working. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I started. I'm on my way. God is still working in my life. God, my Lord, my God, I finished seminary, but God is still working in my life. I preached to thousands of people, but God is still working in my life and if you are here tonight let me tell you right now that the Holy Spirit is on a mission to change and transform your life hallelujah somebody shout he's still working he's still working he's still working in my life God is still working in my life I'm not perfect but I have been forgiven God is still working in my life. God is still working. He is still working. And the Lord as a blacksmith, I say again, is on a mission to transform your life. Amen. Hallelujah. To transform your life. You know what that means? That means that change is possible. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Change is possible. Don't let the devil convince you otherwise. Change is possible. Don't let the devil tell you you're going to be stuck in that same situation for the rest of your life. Change is possible. Change is Oh, come on. You could do better than that. Change is it's possible. Hallelujah. It's possible. With men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. And God is on a mission. He's at work in our lives. And he is constantly changing us and constantly working in us and constantly transforming us. So we can reflect the image of Christ. My God, with God, change is possible. How does this change occur? I was so blessed by the brother who came up here before me and was testifying about when the Lord saved his, his, his life and changed his life through Pastor Daniel's ministry. And I was so blessed and so encouraged. And I said, Lord, thank you for confirming your word. Change is possible with God. With Jesus. Amen. It is possible. So. God. As a blacksmith. First thing he wants you to understand is. That change is possible. And the second thing he wants you to understand is. 
How is this transformation going to happen? How does it happen? Does it happen from one day to another? Is it just somebody places their hand, lays hands on you, and you just wake up the following morning already changed? How does the change happen? How does it, how does it happen in our life? Well, the Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us that the transformation of a, of, of, of a Christian, the transformation is the, is, is the combination or the integration of, of, of divine action and human action. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to slow down. I don't want to lose you. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. Because all this time I thought it was, it was just a divine action. But as I studied the word of God and as I walked with Jesus, I understood that it was the integration of divine action and human action. That we can't leave everything to the Lord because... In 26 years that I've been in ministry, I've understood this. God will never do anything that is your responsibility to do. But he will never want you to do something or expect you to do something that only he can do. You see, we are collaborators with Christ. And how does this transformation occur in our lives? When we collaborate, when the divine action intervenes and the human action takes place. So how are we changed? We just come to church, sit down, listen to a good word, shout, scream, jump, dance. How, how is it that this occurs? How is our, how, how our lives, how, our, how, how is it that the spirit of God is able to transform our lives? He makes us understand. Number one, that the divine action, God's response, God initiates. God initiates. He seeks man. Man does not seek him. He seeks man. I remember uh, I was ministering at a youth conference, and uh, this young man, he was so excited. He had just received Jesus, and he gave me a big hug, and he said, Brother Lugo, I'm so happy. I finally found Christ. I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, Christ has never been lost, so how could you find him? <laughs> Let's restructure that, I said. <laughs> I said, Christ found you. <laughs> you didn't find Christ. Christ found you. We were the one who got lost. We were the ones who got lost. Christ found us. Thank you, Lord, for finding me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. And I want you to understand that as, as this pro process occurs and as this transformation occurs, God already, ha God has already taken action. God has already taken action. God has already done his part. You know, there's something in, in the Latino Pentecostal church. In the Latino Pentecostal church, there was this huge misunderstanding about what it meant to wait on God. In the Latino, I'm talking about the Latino. If you're not Latino, <laughs> if you're not Latino, you're all good. You're all good. <laughs> I'm talking about the Latino. In the Latino traditional Pentecostal church, there was this huge misunderstanding about what, what it really meant to wait on God. And some of us Pentecostals, we thought that waiting on God was just sitting down and doing nothing. And when people ask you, well, what are you doing, brother? I'm just waiting on the Lord. And you know what started to happen? Life began to pass us by. <laughs> Life just began to pass us by. And a whole lot of things that we wanted to do and we wanted to achieve, they just passed us by. And time just flew right by us. And when we didn't accomplish what we wanted or what God had placed in our heart, then we had somebody to blame. Guess who that was? We blame God. When they say, and, and when they would tell us, well, brother, what happened? Didn't you tell me that you had a vision or, or God had placed a dream in your heart or a vision in your life? And, and we say, yeah, but it didn't come to pass because God didn't want to. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, because I, I, was, I was here. I was waiting on the Lord. 
And that was this huge misunderstanding because we thought that waiting on God was doing nothing. And the prophet Isaiah said, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar like wings, like they, they, they will lift wings like eagles. They will soar and they will run and they will walk. Walk and run. Walk and run. Walk and run. Waiting means walking and running. So in which part of the verse did you see any? Did you see the Lord in a passive mode? No, walk and run, they're verbs. They're action words. Those who are waiting on God are running. Those who are waiting on God are walking. They are doing their part. They are doing what they're supposed to do as God is intervening in the supernatural to help them accomplish those things that are impossible. Amen. And so says we just we just wait for the Lord and we want we expect God to do even the things that are our responsibility. And it doesn't happen that way. Let me teach you this. The divine action has already happened. It's already happened. Paul wrote to Titus in, in chapter 3 in verse 5. And he said, Jesus saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see? There was one thing that was impossible for us. And that was saving ourselves. We could not save ourselves. So what does God do? He takes action. He says, I'm going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. I'm going to save you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to cleanse you of your sins. Amen. And at that moment, when the divine action takes place, at that moment, as Christians and as believers, we need to respond to God in human action. He already did his part. His part. The most difficult part, he did it. He died for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. He shed his blood for our sins. And you think you have it hard? And you think you have it rough? He paid the price. So now, what does God expect? Well, he expects from us to respond to the action that he already has taken. Now, Paul teaches us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24, Paul says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So now, look, look at the combination and the integration of divine action and human action. Jesus saves you. Jesus forgives you. Jesus cleanses you with his blood. He could have left you to die. He could have left you in your sins. He could have left you on the floor. He didn't have to save you. He didn't have to rescue you. But his mercy extended to you. And he raised you up. And he lifted you up. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. But now it is our time to react to God's action and to take action in, in, in what is our responsibility of being transformed and putting on a new self. Paul does not say God is going to put on a new self. Paul says that's something you have to do. That's something you have to do. He told the woman, go and sin. I forgive you, but you need to change your lifestyle. I forgive you, but you need a new group of friends. I forgive you, but you need to start hanging out with different people. I forgive you. There's just some things you can't say from up here. (laughs) 
You see, and Paul is teaching us. Paul is teaching us. In order for us to be transformed, you see, sometimes we get frustrated because we look at ourselves and we say, Lord, but why am I still struggling with this? And why am I still uh, dealing with this, Lord? And why haven't I been able to change this in my life? And why? We need to understand how transformation happens in our lives. God has done his part, but now it is our job. We need to start making amends. We need to start changing direction kicking old habits adopting new attitudes connecting with people that can build us instead of destroying us connecting with people that are more spiritual and more mature than us so they can help us grow in the faith Amen? That's how transformation occurs in the life of a Christian. It's not God's responsibility only, and it's not our responsibility only. It's the combination, it's the integration. The human part is our responsibility. And I discovered, and I just want to share with you these three, uh, uh, the three, three ways that you take action in spiritual transformation, and, I'll, and, and, I'll, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Amen? Amen, because the word is good, or amen, because we're going to be dismissed. Which word, which was, which was. You lost me there. You lost me there. You lost me there. Which was it? You lost me there. I'm so sorry. Now, let, 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 let me share this with you. I mean, three ways that we take action to spiritual transformation. Number one, number one, number one, as, as God has done his part, it is now our time to do our part as God continues through his Holy Spirit to change us and transform our lives. Number one, you need to live God's word. You heard what I said. I said, live God's word. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 24, those who hear my words and do them. You see, us Pentecostal, we just, we just thought for some time that it was just enough by reading the word. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 is teaching us that's not enough. You see, the word of God does not change your life until you Put the word of God in action in your life. The word of God does not change your life until you begin to live that word. When I take these principles and I apply them to my marriage. When I take these principles and I apply them to the way I'm raising my children. When I take these principles and I apply them to the way I'm, I'm serving the Lord and, and persevering and, and serving at church and fellowship with my brothers and sisters. The word of God will not transform your life until you apply it in your life. Jesus said it's not enough by just hearing my word. You have to do it. You have to honor my words with your actions. Amen? And a lot of us, we study God's word because we want knowledge. We study God's word because uh, we want to... Uh, we want to grow and, and, and we want to uh, be able to teach and we want to be able to share with many other people the word of God. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The word of God is powerful and it is able to transform any heart and any life. But it will not transform your life until you become a doer of God's word. Until you begin to do what God said, what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my word. Amen? So we need to start living God's word. And all this time we've thought that the word, that the Bible was just for us to read it. No, my brother. No, 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 no. You missed the whole point. You missed it. You missed it. I'm so sorry. You missed it. <laughs> 
You missed the whole point. The word of God is not just for you to read it. It's for you to live it. So somebody tell them, you got to live the word. You got to, you got to live this word. You got to, you got to live this word. Hallelujah. You got to live this word. My God. And as you grow and as you live God's word and as you continue to walk in God's word, your life is being transformed. Number two, number two, number two, number two. Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Hallelujah. Sorry, this is not my Bible. It's Pastor John's Bible. That's so I'm not... Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his, what, what God will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The second thing you need to understand is that in order for you to be transformed by the Spirit of God, you, you can't be conformed to this world. You just can't. Now, what are we supposed to do, Brother Robert? Are we supposed to fly away on a spaceship? I mean, we're here. We're on earth. We, we breathe. We walk. We talk. We eat. We sleep. We, we fellowship. What, what, what are we supposed to do? When Paul says, do not conform to the world, Paul is, what Paul is trying to teach us is that he, we cannot, we cannot uh, settle, set, it, set into the mentality of this world. We cannot conform our minds and our hearts to the, to the pattern of this world. When Paul teaches and he says, do not be conformed, he uses the Greek word, very old uh, Greek word that's, that's, that's called suskematizo, suskematizo, and that word when it is translated it means pattern or steam Paul is saying the world has a pattern and the world was going to want to take you and f and force you into that pattern and tell you every day this is how it's supposed to be this is how you're supposed to think this is how you're supposed to walk this is how you're supposed to love this is the world has its pattern and Paul says you cannot fit in that pattern anymore because there is a new nature in you by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. Paul is saying you cannot, you cannot adjust to the pattern. You cannot adjust because you don't fit anymore. My God. You don't fit anymore. Have you ever felt that you don't fit in? Well, I'm glad you have because you don't. There are certain patterns where you don't fit in anymore. The world has its pattern. The world will tell you, well, you hate those who hate you and you love those who love you. And Jesus said, no, that's not my pattern. You love those who hate you. You pray for those who criticize you. You pray for those who, who, perse who persecute you. I mean, the Lord says there's a new pattern for your life. There's another way to do it. There's another way to do it. There's a new pattern in your life. Paul says, do not be conformed. Don't allow this world to force you into that pattern. Don't allow this world to, to, to place you in that pattern and, and, and have you stuck in a pattern that you know is destroying your life. Spiritual transformation occurs when we understand that the pattern of this world is one that we cannot follow. My God. And uh, you know what? I'm going to say this tonight because it's the last night. And, well, I'm leaving anyway, so. <laughs> but, um. 
and I don't mean to sound legalistic, but we have watered down the gospel so much. And we just, we want the gospel to accommodate to people. We want to adjust the gospel to people. And I'm so sorry, but that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a gospel of carrying a cross. This is a gospel of self-denial. My God. This is a gospel. A gospel of self-denying, not self-fulfillment. And, and we're so busy trying to make Jesus popular. And we want to preach a Jesus that doesn't demand repentance from. And doesn't demand change from us. And yes, he loves you like you are, but he will not leave you that way. He's on a mission to change you. He's on a mission to transform your life. And please don't be offended by this. But we cannot adjust the gospel to what people want. No, no. The word of God is the word of God everlasting the word of God is the standard and we need to live up to the word of God amen we can't conform to a pattern and a watered down gospel that teaches people that you can live your life the way you want to live and 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 it's all good and, and and Christ will walk with you no no Christ walks with you when you are taking steps towards transformation when you are taking steps to holiness when you are taking steps of living a life of free of sin when you are taking when you want my god when you're doing the greatest effort to live in holiness and live a life separated unto god hallelujah Amen. Paul says, do not conform. Tell somebody, tell them, do not conform. Do not conform. Do not conform. Do not conform. Hallelujah. Do not conform. And number three, and I'm going to let you go with this. Hallelujah. This has been the shortest sermon I've ever preached in my entire life. Man, I got to come. I, I got to preach more often at Templo. And number three, number three, number three. Your life is changed and transformed as you learn to overcome discouragement. Listen to what I said. I said, you learn. It's not something that happens automatically. It's not something that happens with a magic wand. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It's not automatic. You don't plug into something and it downloads automatically. It doesn't happen that way. You, we need to learn how to overcome discouragement. We need to learn. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, wrote on one occasion, he said, at the moment that you surrender to God, you give God, you grant God access to begin a process of purification in your life. And this process, he will not stop he will not stop this process no matter how much it hurts or how uncomfortable it may seem. You see, God is changing our lives constantly. And sometimes it will be uncomfortable. And sometimes it will hurt. And sometimes discouragement will knock at your door. And sometimes the devil will tell you it is impossible. And sometimes the enemy will let you, will, will, will try to convince you that, that it, it, your transformation is not really going to happen. That you're always going to be the same person. That you're always going to be the, the, the same uh, um, uh, fallen man that's always tripping on the same stone. And always making the same mistakes. And always falling in love with the same kind of people. And always 
just messing up in, in every single way. And the enemy is bringing discouragement into your heart and into your life. And, and, and he's trying to convince you that God is not going to change you. But I came here tonight to let you know that God is not going to leave you that way. I need to know if there's at least five people that believe it with me. God will not leave you that way. God will not. My God, touch somebody. Tell them God is not going to leave you that way. God is not going to leave you that way. God is not going to leave you that way. Hallelujah. In the process of our transformation. And as we are being my God. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I feel how many can praise God here tonight. I feel the anointing of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Flowing in this house. Hallelujah. And some of you. Hallelujah. Are so discouraged right now. And you feel so down. And you feel like, like everything is crumbling. And you feel like nothing has ever going to change. But let me tell you something. When God is on a mission. He will complete and fulfill his mission. He is on a mission to change your life. He is on a mission to transform. Hallelujah. Your life. And he will finish what he started. But in order for you to overcome discouragement. In order for you to overcome discouragement, there's something you need to start doing. And you need to start doing it right now. So somebody tell them today. Today. You need to start doing it today. Today. My God, my Lord. I know a lot of things in your life haven't gone the way you expected them. And I know a lot of things in your life and a lot of people have failed you and I know a lot of people have disappointed you and maybe you, you, you're you still uh, hurting from a disappointment and you're still hurting because somebody betrayed you or somebody uh, broke a promise or somebody wasn't faithful to what they told you they would be. But let me tell you this. There's something you need to do in order for you to overcome discouragement. And it's something you have to do on your own. Because not all the time will you find somebody that will believe with you. Not all the time will you find somebody that will just stand by you and say, Brother, I'm going to believe this with you. There are going to be times in your Christian walk where you're going to have to believe all by yourself. Because the vision and what God has placed in you, is, 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 is it's so unusual and, 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 and it, it seems so strange to, to so many people. And, and people say, are, are you sure God spoke to you about that? Are you sure the Lord is leading you in that direction? Are you sure the Lord, you're doing what God, you're walking in the direction that the Lord has pointed out for you? Are you sure? Are you sure? And in, in that moment where trials hurt, where family crisis hurt, where dis disappointment hurt, where, where every single, uh, uh, when, when you get hit by life left and right, in that moment, you need to determine, you need to, you need to make a decision and you need to stand your ground and say Lord no matter what happens and no matter what comes my way I'm going to continue to believe I'm going to keep believing I'm going to keep believing Lord I'm on my knees and I'm praying Lord and I'm going to keep believing Lord if nobody wants to believe it with me I'll believe it all by myself but tonight let me see your hands let me hear your praise Hallelujah. Tonight, I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep believing. Give me, give me, give me, give me some value, bro. Help me out, help me out, help me out, help me out. Hallelujah. I'm going to keep believing. 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 People are telling me it's impossible, but I'm going to keep believing. People are telling me it's never going to happen, but I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep believing. Just like the psalmist wrote in Psalm 27, 13. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Lord in the land of the my God my Lord there's a lot of things I'm not sure of but one thing I'm sure of God is faithful 
people. God is. Can somebody celebrate God's faithfulness tonight? The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. His promises are faithful. His promises are faithful. I'm gonna keep. My God, touch three people, tell them I'm going to keep believing. Touch three people, tell them I'm going to keep believing. 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 No matter how many times I fail. No matter how many times I stumble. No matter how many times I fall. No matter how many times I make a bad choice. No matter how many times. No matter my heart is broken. I'm going to keep believing. My heart is Aching, but I'm going to keep believing. My God, the power of the Holy Spirit is here tonight. Lift your hands and give God the glory. Lift your hands and give God the glory. Lift your hands and give God glory. My God. And no matter what comes your way or what life throws at you, my God, be encouraged tonight. And you keep believing. Ministry hurts. Ministry is hard. Ministry is tough. Leonard Ravenhill said, ministry is a calling to bleed. Ministry is a calling to bleed. Ministry is hard. Ministry can hurt sometimes. Hallelujah. But I am still confident, confident in this, my Lord. Ministry can be really tough sometimes. My God. But I believe with all my heart. That what God said he will, he will do. And I believe with all my heart. That his spirit in me. Is working in such a powerful way. That I will see his goodness. My God. I'm broken but I'll keep believing. I'm bruised but I'll keep believing. I've been betrayed but I'll keep believing. I've been abandoned but I'll keep believing. I've been rejected, but I keep believing. I've been ostracized, but I keep believing. I've been talked about and criticized, but I'll keep believing. I'll keep believing. I'll keep believing. I'll keep believing. Pastor John, you keep believing that God will do everything he said he would do. You keep believing. You keep believing, Sister Cindy, that God will do everything he said he would do. You You keep believing. Hallelujah. And sometimes we take a hit. And sometimes, well, hallelujah, the world just throws us down on our knees. Hallelujah. But you know what? You are an overcomer. You just keep believing. You just keep believing in what God is doing in your life. You just keep believing in what God is doing in your heart. And you know what you do? You, hallelujah. You take yourself. You pick yourself up. You try. You dry your tears. You pick yourself up. You dry your tears. You shake it off. And you keep moving forward. And you keep moving forward. And you keep moving. How many say? How many can say glory to God tonight? How many can praise God in this house? You pick yourself up. You dry your tears. You shake it off. And you keep you keep believing you keep believing you keep believing you keep believing a hundred years have passed and we are still believing And if anyone ever asks you, well, what happened with what the Lord promised you? Well, what happened with 
that vision or that project or that ministry that you spoke about so much. You don't have to shy away. No need to shy away. You just let them know that you're still believing.